I've seen the lightning flashing and heard the thunder roll. I felt these tears dashing, trying to conquer my soul. I've heard the voice of Jesus telling me still to fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. winds are blowing, temptation sharp and keen. I feel a peace in knowing my Savior stands between. He stands to shield from danger when earthly friends are gone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. Never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. When in affliction's valley I'm treading rod of care, my Savior helps me carry. My cross went heavy to bear, my feet entangled with briars, ready to cast me down. My Savior whispers his promise, never to leave me alone. No, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Never to leave me, never to leave me alone. He died for me on the mountain, for me they pierced his side. For me he opened that fountain, the crimson cleansing tide. For me he waiteth in glory, seated upon his throne. He promised never to leave me. Never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me. Never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me. Never to leave me alone. Go with me to uh, Joshua in chapter 6. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 6. <clears throat> Today we're talking about our door of hope. Our door of hope. In the end of that chapter, Joshua 6 and verse 26, and then I'm going to read the entirety of Joshua chapter 7. <clears throat> Joshua 6 and verse 26, the Bible reads, And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. Chapter 7. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. 
For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethaven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up. But let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us round and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed, from among you. Up, sanctify the people and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning, And brought Israel by their tribes. And the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah. And he took the family of the Zarhites. And he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man. And Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household man by man. And Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, my son, Give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, and 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran unto the tent and behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why 
hast thou troubled us. The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire. And they had stoned them with stones. After they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor. So here at the end of Joshua chapter 6, of course, we find a great victory. And the fame thereof resonates throughout all the lands around. This was the case where Joshua and the children of Israel went about and they compassed that land seven times on the seventh day, and one time for the other days, and received of the promise of God. Look with me in Joshua 6 and verse 2. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times. And the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when ye hear the sound of the trumpet. All the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city shall fall down flat. And the people shall ascend every man straight up before him at which time they went and they destroyed the city of Jericho and all the inhabitants thereof. God gave a great victory through this miracle. They walked about the city. That's it. Walking in circles, walking in circles. And finally on that seventh day, seven times they went round about, blew the horn, and that city wall came down flat. Their defenses were destroyed by the power of God, and therefore they could not defend against the people Israel. God set it up that his people could not lose this battle. And then, after the promise was fulfilled, the fame thereof went up throughout all the land of the great kingdom that God was setting up, Israel. They lost this battle that the people looked upon as nothing. They said, we don't need to send a whole bunch of people for this AI has but a few. And as a result, why should we make everybody labor in this battle? Send about 3,000, we certainly can't overtake them. But the Bible says that God's people fled before this, relatively speaking, small army compared to what they had just faced. <clears throat> they fled before them and lost 36 that day. Their hearts melted, became as water. God's people destroyed physically and also emotionally and spiritually brought to havoc because they could not defeat such a small enemy. God does a great miracle in destroying a big enemy. A small enemy brings them to ruin. What's going on here? And we find out in the course of this chapter that Israel hath sinned. They transgress the covenant as a result of one man, this Achan, and his sins. God said, destroy all of their stuff. Don't bring any of it back. And Achan looked and coveted after this Babylonish garment, 200 shekels of silver, this, this silver, the, the, these, these weights of, of precious metals, and he brought them and hid them under his stuff. And then looked upon as his brethren went to battle and lost. Joshua prays unto God. God says, Israel hath sinned. This man hath taken of the accursed thing. Therefore, all of you are accursed. The judgment of God falls upon his own people. To what end? Not destruction, though Joshua looked for a moment and said, what, what shall the enemies say? What shall the Canaanites say of your great name when they see us fall to Ai? What shall they say when we're destroyed and flee before our enemies? God's end was not that they would be destroyed, but God's end was that the judgment that he placed upon them would cause them to get right with him. And that's the whole point of the story of Achan. Of course, Achan had no chance for repentance. If he was a believer, he was, if he was saved, certainly the Lord took him home sooner than expected as a result of this sin. He did confess it readily. He did, he did face the consequences 
And as a result of his death and destruction, Israel then could stand before their enemies. Look at the end of that chapter. It said after they stoned him and burned him and, and, and raised up this great heap upon him, the end of verse 26 says, So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. And that was the ultimate desired end that God had. He gave them anger in order that he could turn away from it when they repented. And took away of the accursed thing and destroyed the accursed one. His anger turned. And it says, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. God's anger turned away for the sin of the camp. He turned away once it was taken care of. Judgment fell. They got right as a result of repenting after the judgment took place. When God's anger turned, that place forever took on that namesake, the Valley of Achor. Because the Lord turned from his anger there. Our road to revival, to restoration, and you can turn to Hosea, chapter 2 Hosea chapter 2 that's after Ezekiel after Daniel the book of Hosea our road then to revival follows that we must be reconciled with our God and here we see an indication that quite often that has to happen on the other side of judgment what does that mean? Well, we're hard-headed enough that we don't see our failures and our faults. It takes us going out against an AI, a seemingly small enemy, a small battle, a small challenge in our life, and failing miserably is an act of judgment of God to realize something is wrong here. God has done great things in my life, and now something so small in comparison, I've failed at. What is going on? Judgment of God falls Repentance takes place. Restoration comes. And revival happens in our lives. But it's often, unfortunately, on the other side of the judgment of God. Hosea chapter 2. <clears throat> we need to pass through that door of judgment sometimes. Hosea 2, look at verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. And bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Now, who's this her that it's talking about? Hosea was a prophet that was told to take a wife of whoredoms. Right? He would have been disqualified because his wife was running around on him. His wife was an harlot in the city. His wife had many lovers. And he took her unto himself at the command of God and had children by her even. This is the her that he's talking about. And this her, Hosea's wayward, departing wife, unfortunately is a type of God's people and a type of the church at large where we stand here today. Verse 15, after God talks about bringing her into the wilderness, speaking comfortably unto her, he says in verse 15, And I will give her her vineyards from thence, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. This place of judgment, this place where it said God turned from the fierceness of his wrath, was the same place where God saw fit to take a wicked person and have him destroyed by stones and burning and then heat put upon him on the heels of judging his people. And on the other side of this judgment, is a door of hope. We need to pass through this door. The Bible says this place of judgment is our door of hope by extension, by practical application. He continues on and says, and she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, when as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. So as it was when she had saw this great victory coming out of the land of Egypt by the miracle of God. So God is promising that she will return to that blessed state, singing and praising and, and, and that youthful fervor is the moment that she was first redeemed 
from her captors. We can think back as the moment that we were first redeemed from our sins and saved by the blood of Jesus and think back to that time and where we are now. How far have we come? She can return to that singing as before, to that good time of fellowship with the Lord. But she has to pass through that door of hope the valley of Achor. Verse 16, it says, And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishai, and shalt call me no more Balai. Ishai, husband. Balai, master or Lord. What he's saying here is, I believe, is, is there will be a return of God's people from the regiment of following a master and the structure of following a Lord to the loving relationship of a husband and wife. Now when we think about our walk with God, isn't it much better to be in that loving, compassionate, give and take relationship as opposed to just Him being Lord and master and regiment and, and commanding and forcing and that strong hand? This is what God is promising to his people. And he used Hosea's wayward wife as an example of that. She can return to that loving state of husband and wife in that blessed relationship. But she has to go through the door of hope. She has to go through the valley of Achor. She has to go through that place of the judgment of God. What he's giving her at this time is a knowing of God, a relationship of, with God, a communion with God, as opposed to simply that master status and servant position. And I believe that creates confusion. Look at the word, Balai. Think about Balaam. Think about the many Balaam that are mentioned in the Bible. Every time that's referred to, quite often it's a devil. It's a demonic lord. It's a demonic master that, the, that these people serve as gods. And it seems that God's people have given that title to the Lord. Balai. Balai. The world's devils, of course, rule over men. And they do it with rigor. They're harsh. They're hard. When you look at how the, the people of this world serve their Baal, serve their masters, serve their gods. It's hard. It's harsh. The, the regiment, every morning I see, I see the, the Muslims go in and, and, and get in their prayer thing at the exact time every day and recite the exact same prayers. And if they don't, they feel that they will not reach their heaven. We look at the, the Catholics over in the Philippines areas where they are whipping themselves and beating themselves. We look at the monks that out there have, have excluded themselves from all pleasures in order to serve their Baal, serve their master. The world's devils certainly rule over man. And there's obviously confusion happening here because God's people have given themselves over to have that same relationship with the Father who wants to be a father, who wants to be a husband unto them, who wants to have a loving relationship with them, and yet they've put themselves into a position of servitude. Of course, there's a time and a place, but we see the confusion that has taken place. God wants to be called Ishai. He wants to be called husband. He wants to be close in his relationship with his church and with his people. God wants to meet with us in fellowship. He wants to know us. He doesn't just want to lord over us. Continuing on in verse 17, it says, For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant with them, or for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground and I will break the bow and the sword and the bottle of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in 
faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. And that's key. That's the relationship that God wants. He wants to be known of us, and he wants us to know him. Look at verse 23. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people. And they shall say, Thou art my God. Restoration has taken place. But first, we must pass through that valley of Achor, through that door of hope, from judgment to repentance to restoration to revival. This door of hope could be our only hope. And this is the thing that God's been working in my heart, and I've actually seen it from some preacher friends. They're starting to move in that direction. That judgment is coming. Judgment must begin where? At the house of God. Right? <clears throat> this door of hope is a door of separation. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 65. Now, when we think about judgment, we often get worried and concerned, and certainly there are fearful times ahead of us. There are things to worry about and be concerned about. And Isaiah chapter 65 talks about, though, that there is a positive to it. And we can certainly see that. God went in the time of Joshua from working in their lives, performing miracles, giving them great victories, to in a moment because of the sin of one, judging them all. To the end, though, that he wanted them to see their fault, repent, be restored, and brought back to that good and proper relationship with him. The door of hope, the valley of Achor. It's a door of separation. Look at Isaiah chapter 65 and in verse 1. It says, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. And this is the thing that Christians are going to have to now put ourselves in. Okay, When we look at this in context, this is God talking about his people Israel and how they're rebellious, they're not hearing God, they're not interested in fellowship and relationship with God doing his will. And so God is going to go unto a nation that wasn't even seeking for him. He's going to go unto the Gentiles through the ministry of Christ. By and large, that's what's being discussed in the book of Isaiah. But there is a fullness of the Gentiles that's going to come in, and a shift is going to happen again. And us as God's people, Christians here, believers here today, are going to find ourselves in a role reversal, I believe. And now there will begin to be a people that is not known by his name that will be sought of by the Lord. And we're going to find ourselves here in verse 2 and down, standing today as this rebellious people, Christians in, by and large. It says in verse 2, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that is not good after their own thoughts. And when you think about what is known as Christianity this day, think about this. A rebellious people walking in their own way. It's a not a good way after their own thoughts they seek after God. Verse 3 says, A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrifice in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick. They've got other ways of worship that the Lord never appointed. Verse 4 says, which remain among the graves and lodge in monuments and eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels, which say, stand by thyself. Come not near unto me, for I am holier than thou. Isn't it amazing that the people that are in full rebellion against God, that are, that are doing exact opposite of what he commanded, that are accepting swine's flesh when at this time he said, eat it not. He hadn't cleaned the pig yet. Broth of abominable things in their vessels. 
And I can think of a few applications toward that. We're to mind our vessels and take care of those things. But there's abominable things flowing in them that God commanded not. And they have these false ways of worship and they're burning incense upon altars of bricks. They're remaining among the graves. Death is what they're worshiping, it seems. And there's all these things that they are doing wrong and God calls them rebellious. And they say, stand by thyself, come not near me, for I am holier than thou. They're smug. They're proud. They think that they're doing God's will. They couldn't be further from it. God says of them, at the end of verse 5, These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. God here is promising recompense and judgment to this rebellious people. And in verse 1, he indicates that there will be one that knew him not, nor called his name who will seek him as a result. We stand here today, by and large, as Christians, as Israel did at the time of Isaiah. Rebellious people, following our own ways and our own thoughts. But look at what God does. We're talking about the door of separation that comes as a result of judgment. Pass through that door, and it's a door that creates separation. Verse 8, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster... And one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. So the blessing here within that cluster is that not all of them will be destroyed. This new wine, this new covenant, this new commission is found in the cluster Destroy it not. That's the blessing. God's promising that he will not destroy them all, but there is something that he has to do in order to get that wine out of the cluster. Got to break the grapes. Verse 9, And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. And Sharon shall be a fold of flocks, and watch this, valley of Achor, a place for the herds to lie down in, for my people that hath sought me. And so God, as he's promising, judgment will fall upon those that are rebellious, which know his thoughts but follow not after him. He is saying that there will be a remnant that will not be destroyed. For the servant's sake, he will not destroy them all. But what he does say is, Sharon shall be a fold for flocks, and the valley of Achor, the other side of the judgment that has taken place, the other side of the, the punishment that has been exacted, there is a place of peace for the people that have sought God. And this is what we need to be looking out for. There is judgment that's going to fall, and it's going to first fall upon God's people. And when it does, it's only to the end that there would be a preserved remnant, not destroyed, that are able to lay down in peace. There's a blessing there. Verse 11, it says, But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. Therefore will I number you with the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. What God here is indicating very clearly He's not beating around the bush is that if you want to be one that's not destroyed, if you want to be one that rests in the other side of the judgment that is coming in that valley of Achor, the place where God turned from the fierceness of his wrath, then don't be numbered with those that when God calls, you don't answer. 
That when God speaks, you don't hear. Don't be one that continues to do evil before his eyes and choose what doesn't delight the Lord. We ought to choose to delight God. We ought to choose righteousness. We ought to hear when God calls. We ought to answer when he speaks and respond with yes, Lord, yes. Verse 13, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall howl for vexation of spirit. Look, judgment is going to fall, but God's servants will be provided for. We talked about that a little bit in the first message. And this one is giving us the same indication that when God's judgment falls, when he starts to come down on the ones that provoke him to anger, those that eat abominable things which he ordained not, when he starts to wreak havoc in the lives of those that do not hear him when he calls and do not answer when he speaks and continually do evil and the things that he doesn't delight in, those will be the ones that are hungry. Those will be the ones that are thirsty. Those will be the ones that are ashamed. Those will be the ones that are full of sorrow of heart and shall howl for vexation of spirit. If you don't want to be numbered among those that are brought to ruin and wreck and have nothing, then you need to be in the account and in the number of those called his servant. Walking with God. And what does that entail here from the context? Hearing when he calls. Answering when he speaks. Do righteousness before him and not choosing the things that he has no delight in. When famine comes, when pestilence comes, when naked comes, when peril comes, when sword comes, God's servants shall eat. God's servants shall drink. God's servants shall rejoice and be full of joy of heart. Despite what God seems to be indicating here, despite the fact that everything around him is complete opposite. Great exploits are coming in these last days. Miracles are going to be performed by God for his servants and those that seek him. Verse 15, And you shall leave your name for a curse unto the, my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. That he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from mine eyes. Blessed in the earth is a result of them following after the God of truth. Those that seek him, the Bible says at the end of verse 10, will be the ones that lay down with their herds in the valley of Achor, the door of hope for those people that have sought after the Lord God. Next, I'm going to go to Isaiah chapter 26. That was the door of separation. You notice how God very clearly indicates there's a line to be drawn between those that are his servants and those that are rebels. When judgment falls... When God renders his indignation, when God, when God acts in his wrath, his servants will have and the other will have not. This is some of the things we need to apply to our hearts by faith and, and start praying about. Isaiah chapter 26. We just talked about the door of separation. Here we're talking about the valley of Achor, the door of hope, being a door to righteousness or recompense. In other words, there will be a decision to be made. Verse 1, it says, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. 
We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. We need to be trusting in God even when His righteous judgments are falling upon the earth. Even falling upon His people who have been rebellious. The Valley of Achor, look, it isn't always fun. Of course. I'm sure there's people that were good friends with Achan. I'm sure there was people that were good friends with his children. He doesn't seem like he's a wicked, bad, awful guy, given that he readily admitted his fault and even showed them the stuffs. Nevertheless, judgment had to take place, and certainly it's not fun to go through that. It wasn't fun for the 36 people that died as a result of his sin. It wasn't fun for the, the whole congregation that had to stone him with stones, burn him, and bury him. That's not fun and enjoyable. But the other side of that judgment is the Valley of Achor, the door of hope. For us today even. Verse 5 there in Isaiah 26 it says, For he bringeth down them that dwell on high. The lofty city he layeth it low. He layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. The foot shall tread it down. Even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. The way of the just is uprightness. Thou most upright dost weigh the path of the just. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, we have waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. Waiting a long while for judgment to fall. And honestly, I'm starting to get there. There was a time when I was hoping that this thing would turn around and we'd get back to normal. But now I'm waiting a while for the judgment of God to fall. This is what's impressed on my heart. In the way of thy judgments, O Lord, we have waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. And that's why I stand in the way of judgment. His judgments at this point is because my desire is to his name. And the remembrance of him. And when I look around, nobody else is in that state. Very few, aside from this gathering here, are in that state. Desire his name to be lifted up. Constantly remembering him and all of his goodness and giving him thanks. This world just can't wait for them to save themselves. They're looking for a, a man messiah. Savior in the form of a shot or a drug or a, who knows. So we stand in the way of his judgments, waiting for him. It's a lonely place. Certainly this state is is it's suffering at times. And this is how I'm I'm starting I'm starting to feel and be impressed with. We're we're waiting for God to show himself. This is the door of hope. This is our only hope, is that God's judgment would fall. Because watch this. Verse 9. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness and there's no hope for that without him and his judgments being in the earth. Men will continue to do their own thing, their own way, follow their own gods, serve their own Balaam, Until God intervenes and judges this earth. When his judgments are on this earth, finally some will get it and learn righteousness. Let's hope it's the righteousness that's with Christ. And that's where we'll come in to lead him there. But look what has to take place first. Judgment falls. Judgment needs to fall 
to bring people to a decision to change. Because most people will just decide that the way that they're on is, is good enough. Look at verse 10. Sad, sad state of men. Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet he, will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Some people think that we're going to show favor to the wicked. We're going to just love them all the way into Jesus. Show them favor. Bless them. The Bible says in that upright land, those with wicked hearts will still sow wickedness. Still yield wickedness. In the land of uprightness, they will deal unjustly and they will never, never, never behold the majesty of the Lord. Love, 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 love. That, that gospel is not going to work. It gets to a point. Verse 11, it says, Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see. And think about that. It's almost like a pause. We're, we're showing favor unto the wicked, hoping that us showing our Christian love to them, they'll just be like, what must I do to be saved? And they'll want to come to our meeting and they'll want to come to our Savior because we've, we've shown the wicked so much love. He says, they'll continue to deal unjustly and they'll not behold the majesty of the Lord. Verse 11 says, when thy hand is lifted up, it's like a pause. God's like, okay, it's time. Are you ready? They won't see it. And I got this feeling that somewhere in heaven, God's hand is up. Are you ready? Are you looking? Are you paying attention? I'm calling, will you answer? I'm speaking, will you hear? The Bible says, but they shall see and be ashamed for their envy at the people. Yea, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. What's happening here is that God's hand is up. They won't see, but they will see once the enemy steps in. Once the fire of the enemies come to devour them. Then they'll see. When judgment falls, they'll be brought to a time when they need to choose, when they need to decide. Verse 12, Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us. For thou Hast, for thou also hast wrought all our works in us. See, those that know him and love him give glory to him. All of my good works are not of me. <laughs> all of my righteousness is, is him. He wrought, he did, he performed all the works in us. That's the whole purpose of God saving us. That we should live a godly life. That we should do good works. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And not only did he ordain that we should walk in those good works that he's doing through us, but he also ordained that there's peace available when we do, when we yield ourselves, when we, when we give him opportunity to work through us and to do great works in us. Verse 13 says, O Lord, our God, other lords beside thee have had dominion of us. Other Baal beside thee have had dominion over us. But by thee only will we make mention of thy name. We're holding his name. Those that are serving God, those that are walking with God, those that are giving him the glory, those that are known as his servants that he wants to bless, that he wants to separate from the rest of the world, that he wants to show his provision and strong protection over those that are walking and making mention of his name through his power, holding his name like their Ishai, like their husband and wife relationship there. Which is, of course, Christ's relationship with his church, with the body. It says, though we're under tribute, we serve only God. That's verse 13 there. Other lords have had dominion over us. And certainly where we stand today, we have other lords that have 
dominion over us. But by thee only will we make mention of thy name. We serve only God. We hold only his name. We make mention only of his name. We serve God over serving men. Now we can start to see the judgment as it might come in a time not too far off. And we'll start to see the confidence that we should place in God as we go through these things. Verse 13, it says that we are under dominion at times, but making mention only of his name. And now here's another contrast and a decision that can be made. Verse 14, they are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. Thou hast increased the nation, O Lord. Thou hast increased the nation. Thou art glorified and thou hast removed it far unto the ends of the earth. Lord, in trouble have they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. And that's the wonderful, blessed side effect often of judgment of God falling, is that when his chastening comes, they pour out a prayer. They cry unto him. They're visiting the Lord. Finally, the decision was made in that moment of judgment. Choose ye this day whom you'll serve. Will you fall after righteousness or will recompense fall upon you? Verse 17, like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have wrought any deliverance in the earth. Neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Thy dead man shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. This great judgment is falling. But we ought to have confidence in God at this time. When you choose righteousness, when you choose Him, again, He will care for you. And you can put your trust in Him that He will keep you in perfect peace. Ordain peace over you. Why? Verse 4. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And so that God that has everlasting strength, that salvation belongs to, that God who is appointed for walls and bulwarks, that God that is constantly desiring to keep us in perfect peace with a steadfast mind upon him, says in verse 20, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. And I believe that's what's going to happen in this time of judgment falling. His indignation will come in a moment. We can hide ourselves at that time until it is over past. Verse 21, For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. And that is a frightening thought. And this is why I'm starting to believe that judgment is imminent. I'm looking forward to it only because of what's on the other side and what's promised to me during it. Come for a moment and hide, he says, until that ignition is overpassed. But look what the problem, it's literally bubbling to the surface. The earth is disclosing the blood and shall no more cover her slain. As the blood of innocence has, has seeped into the earth throughout the millennia, the earth is done with holding it in. And God is coming out of his place to judge the inhabitants of the earth. And glory to God, when it happens, there will be a few that for the chastening will pray unto him, pour out their heart unto him and seek after him. And God will ordain peace unto them as well. And say, come, my people, enter into thy chambers. Come, thy people, shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself. As my indignation falls. This time of judgment, this valley of Achor that follows, the door of hope, our only hope, is also one that brings a decision. Will you choose righteousness? Or will you fall into the recompense of God Almighty God. Will you trust in Him? Or will you face His strength in the fury of His anger as it falls upon you? 
That's a decision that needs to be made. And I'm glad for God's judgment, for when his judgment is in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Glory to God. Finally, I can yell and shout and scream and kick and preach and teach and, and stress and pull and tug and fight with people to learn righteousness. But when God steps in with his judgments, <laughs> that can do a whole word of world of help to my meager efforts up here, my meager efforts out there. This is why I look forward to it. My soul, with my soul, I've desired in the night. With my soul, I've sought him early. I've been waiting in the way of his judgments, desiring that his name would be glorified, remembering all that he has done, hoping for the time when his judgments will fall and righteousness will finally be learned in this world. We saw the door of separation. We saw the door to righteousness or recompense. Your choice. Go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter near the end of your Bible. Just before Revelation, Jude, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, you have 2nd Peter and 1st Peter. During that time, we see God's people separated. We see God's people kept until the indignation is passed over. The other purpose of the judgment of God, the valley of Achor, the door of hope, the road that we need to walk of judgment to repentance, to restoration and to revival. This door is a door of purging for God's people. Look at 1 Peter 4. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. So here he says, arm yourself with that same mind. As Christ suffered in the flesh, you need to be thinking in the same direction, the same mindset, the same framework. He says that he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Verse 2, it says that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. What's he saying here? He should no longer sin. Why? Because when God's judgment comes, when suffering enters in, and we will face suffering, though God will protect us. Certainly when the world goes through the turmoil, when the persecution ramps up, we're not going to be free from suffering. No, 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 that's not what we're promising. But what we're promising is the latter end shall be blessed. And when all of the distractions of this life are removed, when we are suffering in the flesh, certainly we cease from sin because our focus and our will has changed to match up with the will of God, I believe is what he's saying here. Verse 3, it says, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in the lasciviousness, lusts, excessive wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. And as our walk changes and we start to suffer in the flesh as a result of following Christ. And the Bible says, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So as we live godly or as we follow after him, certainly our suffering will ramp up for his sake. He says, in that time past, when you walked in all their ways, they wish that you would stay in that same way. They, they think it's strange that you run not with them doing those same things you used to do. And they'll even speak evil of you. And that's when the hatred will ramp up. Verse 5, it says, Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. And this is why we go and we preach the gospel to those that are dead in their trespasses in sins, in order that they would be judged of men, in order that they would be rebuked by God and corrected by his word, to the end that they begin to live godly by following after God in the Spirit. But here's the warning. The end of all things is at hand. 
Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Now what I believe Peter was talking about was, was the judgment that was about to take place during the time of Nero, that great persecution when they came in and the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. He's saying the end of all things is at hand as far as their little microcosm of, of being consisted. But for us, we can apply that to our lives. The end of all things is at hand. Each and every day we ought to look for the hastening of God as he seeks to return. Verse 8, and above all things, have fervent charity. Now here's the charge that he's giving to his people at this time. And it's one of purging. He says, get rid of the lust. You're suffering, so cease from sin. Allow that suffering to focus your mind into the will of God. They'll think it's strange. They have this excessive riot. They're speaking evil of you. But go and preach to them that they might be judged in the flesh and live according to the Spirit of God. But for you, now who are saved, with the end of all things at hand and before you, what should we do? Get to work. What should we do? Clean up our lives. Purge these things. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Verse 8. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one with another without grudging. Great practical teaching here from the Apostle Peter. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Great teaching. Go back and study those point by point, jot by jot, word by word. These are things that when the end is nigh, we ought to be growing in. Verse 12, it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to trial. This is, try you. This is a promise. He says, don't think it's strange. Don't be confused. Don't be confounded. This is normal and right this fiery trial, which is to try you, which will absolutely, without a doubt, try you. Don't think it's strange as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice. So when trials enter in, we ought not be like, what's going on? This is so hard. What's going on in my life? Rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. In other words, your joy is being fulfilled as you partake in the fellowship of the sufferings with Christ. That's a backwards way of thinking, and that's why we know it's a spiritual way of thinking. Don't live according to men in the flesh. Live according to God in the Spirit, and you'll start to understand why being tried and suffering in the flesh leads you away from sin and towards joy. Those things are opposite. If you are not joyful, you might have sin in your life. Check yourself. If you're full of sin, absolutely, you will not be joyful. If you get rid of sin, your joy will increase. And when does your sin decrease? The Bible says here, when you're suffering in the flesh. Suffering is never a bad thing in the cause of Christ. Suffering causes repentance. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And that's exactly what happened in the time of Joshua. They suffered loss as a result of sin. No joy, no happiness, no rejoicing gone from them when they recognized the problem was sin. They got rid of the sin. They got rid of the sinner and joy returned as a result of what? Judgment leading to repentance, leading to a right attitude with God, restored in his fellowship. We continue on. And it says, verse 14, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. The time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? 
Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. How do you commit your soul fully unto God, your being, all you are? By doing good, by doing well, by living after the commands that Peter has just outlined here. Be sober, watch unto prayer, give fervent love to your brethren, hospitality, show it one to another, give gifts as you're receiving gifts, speak the oracles of God, minister as the ability that God has given you, that God can be glorified, and it's to him that praise and dominion belongs to forever and ever and ever, amen. The trials that you are going through are only bringing you to the point of purging. As the fiery trials increase and the suffering increases, the Bible says in verse 1, you'll cease from sin. Trials are there to alert you to the fact that you have impurities. Fire reveals impurities, doesn't it? When you want to make gold more pure, you put fire to it and the impurities fall away. So when God wants to make you, Christian, more pure, he puts fire to you so that the impurities will melt away. And here God is indicating, I believe, as he says in verse 7, the end of all things is at hand, therefore do such and such and such and such. He said the time has come, verse 17, the judgment must begin at the house of God. And this is how God's going to do things. Judgment is going to arrive. It will be a door of hope for us. The Valley of Achor. Our only hope as believers is to go through the door unto separation. Go through the door and choose the way of righteousness, not the judgment and recompense of God. Go through the door and allow him to purge you and make you whiter than snow and the end result will be blessed. And the end result will be great exploits. And the end result will be Christians living after the manner of God as he intended. It's a door of hope for us. Judgment is that door of hope, our only hope. And I'm believing that more and more every day. After the judgment, after they stoned Achan, after God named it the Valley of Achor, for that's where his fierce anger had turned when they made a recompense on the sinner and put away the ungodliness among themselves. After that, God says this, and The Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee, and arise, go up, to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. And thou shalt do to Ai and her king as thou didst to Jericho and her king. He says, I'll be back performing miracles the same way that I did before the valley of Achor, before judgment fell, before you entered that door of hope. Only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall you take for a prey unto yourself. What a blessing. He says only this time you can take the prey. You can take the blessing. You can take the sustenance. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it. Look at verse 18. It says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in thine hand toward Ai, for I will give it into thine hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city. And the ambush arose quickly out of her place, and they ran as soon as they had stretched out his hand, and they entered into the city and took it, and hasted to set the city on fire. When the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended up to heaven, and they had no power to flee this way or that way. And the people that fled to the wilderness turned back upon their pursuers. And when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, then they turned again and slew the men of Ai. And the other issued out of the city against them. So they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side, and they smote them so that they let none of them escape. God here reveals that after the judgment, after the separation, after the purging, after the choice for righteousness, he'll return in the fullness of his revival for us great power and great majesty and great glory and give us victory over our enemies. But we got to be willing to go through that door. I believe that door is before us. When we see it, I think we'll know. Just choose right.
Thank you, Father.